Well, what we'd like to do now is to open this up to questions. The podium is going to be removed here. I'm going to grab this mic so I can moderate the questions. Thank you. And um, there will be two people roving around with microphones. And so please raise your hand if you have a question or comment. And we'll alternate sides of the room. And our experts here will endeavor to answer your questions. Right there. Uh, hello. Thanks, everyone. Truly really fantastic program. I'm um, so happy to be here. Uh, so I feel like during Climate Week and um, just, I guess, Penn sustainability in general, I've been hearing a lot about climate resilience and climate adaptation. That's all very human focused. And of course, you know, as humans, we have fantastic technology at our disposal. Other species do not. Where is the hope if there is any for non-human species? Great question. Who wants to take a shot at that? If only because I can make a plug. Um, <laughs> um, we are increasingly understanding the intersections between the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And, and one of the things that we see in that context is that we need not only to conserve a lot of lands, but we also need to bring lands back in a responsible and good way, because there's a lot of greenwashing in that, in, in, in that space for our uh, ecosystems to, to thrive, but also to migrate, because that's an, an, an important part. Mm -hmm. And so I see with initiatives of basically saying, keep 30 to 35% from the earth land as conservation areas, there's there's a lot of work being done. I really applaud the criticism of much of the offset uh, companies as a way to not uh, 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 do that, and and I I see the the movement to link biodiversity and climate to become stronger and stronger. The plug is to a symposium at Weizmann called Mega Eco uh, on October 5th, where we'll be discussing and exploring a lot of these very large conservation, continent scale often, conservation efforts that, that are being proposed now. We think there's a new project category happening with all its pitfalls and all its promise, and we hope to discuss that on uh, uh, October 5th. Thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, Ji Sung. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I'm going to try to stay within my disciplinary lane and not venture too far, but I think it's important to note two things. One is any of us who spoke about the importance of adaptation and resilience take probably take as baseline premise the absolute need to rein in emissions as quickly as possible, as much as possible. And especially if you care about biodiversity, I think that is all the more true. That being said, again, I'm not an ecologist, but my understanding of the literature is that, uh, I guess I'm an armchair ecologist. I once did a semester abroad in Australia doing rainforest ecology. We, but we should all be ecologists at this point. I agreed. <laughs> but my understanding is that even for biodiversity, for instance, coral reefs, um, there are many steps that we as humans can take to boost reef resiliency so that the effects of climate change on biodiversity are at least minimized. But you're right. Humans have more technology at their disposal than animals do, that's for sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I love this question. And one of the things that got me very interested in working in water is that we share it with non-human species. And a long time ago, I thought I would work on biodiversity preservation, but this is a pretty challenging area to work on. And I thought about how water is really the veins and the arteries that pump through our ecosystems. And riparian habitats are one of the most important habitats that we build. And if we take care of water resources, that means we're helping the riparian habitat around it. And we're really helping the whole eco ecology around it. So if we think about who is kind of sucking on the straw that is pulling our water out of our rivers, that would be us humans. And we can kind of limit what we're doing in terms of sucking on the straw. We are by consequence, helping taking care of our environment. So I think working on water management has wonderful spillover effects on biodiversity preservation. Thanks. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, point out that um, 
when we talk about biodiversity protection and the survival of other species, first and foremost uh, for that to work is the preservation of habitat and not just habitat extent, but also habitat quality. And we have landmark legal protections for species of special concern and environments that face um, extreme uh, and special threats, at least in our legal system in the United States. Um, and so it's absolutely the wrong direction when the Supreme Court rolls back protections for water, uh, for water and wetland quality uh, enshrined in the Clean Water Act. And maybe a better uh, trajectory might be that pursued by nations like um, Ecuador, which have enshrined the rights of nature as part of their constitutions, and maybe uh, for at least the lawyers to speak on nature's behalf in courts of law. Mike, please. Yeah, um, I'd make a, a couple points here. Uh, first of all, uh, we had an event uh, yesterday at Perry World House, actually, about uh, extinction and, and climate and, and, the, uh, and, and the way that they interact. Um, it, we often frame uh, these choices, uh, our choices, our policy choices in term, uh, using terminology like <clears throat> uh, ecosystem services, where we're basically attributing a value to ecosystems and animal species based on what they can do for us, what they can provide to us. I think that's an overly anthropocentric view of um, the problem. Uh, there is no economy, as I like to say, uh, on a dead planet. And so I think we have to start thinking about the intrinsic value of ecosystems and species and recognize our obligation to preserve that. Um, Another blatant plug, I suppose, for the, our fragile moment. One of the things that I talk about in the book are past extinction events. Um, and uh, are they analogs for what's happening today? And we see in some ways they're not. In other ways, they are. Uh, the great dying that happened 250 million years ago uh, was due to a massive input of carbon pollution into the atmosphere, a sudden warming uh, that led to uh, the loss of 90% of all species um, on the face of the planet and 96% of ocean species in part because of deoxygenation and uh, what's been described by my uh, former Penn State colleague Lee Kemp as a global stink bomb where hydrogen sulfide uh, mm. filled the oceans. Mm. Um, we don't have that in store. That is not a likely scenario for us. But what is important here is that the great dying involved a massive input of carbon dioxide, just like we're doing today with fossil fuel burning. It was natural back then, but it was 100 times slower than what we're doing today. Um, when it's slow enough, living things can adapt to these changes. But when you change the conditions of our planet as rapidly as we are today, there is no analog in the past for what we're doing today. And that really underscores the principle of precaution and the need for dramatic action. A terrific question. Um, another question from over there. This is a question. Um, I, OK, I'm not sure how to hold this. <laughs> You're good. Alice and Lasseter, I guess, um, about um, water mining. And can you talk a little bit about oh. this is sorry. I know it's going on and off. How do I hold it? Just right there. OK. Um, can you talk a little bit about how water Water mining. Just yell. <laughs> How, how water mining interacts with uh, drought and other topics. <laughs> Microphones. Uh, by water mining, you mean uh, using like fossil groundwaters? Oh, yeah. Uh, Okay, so one of the challenges that we have with groundwater is that it's really poorly understood. We have very poor ways of monitoring it. Up until very recently, we kind of just pretended like it was this limitless pool beneath us, which is not the case. But because it's been poorly understood, it's also been very poorly regulated. And so there's a lot of states where there's sort of no rules on how much water you can pump. Now, naturally, this makes the resource almost free. The only cost is the cost of pumping it. So this is not a reasonable thing because we should not be kind of pricing water so that it's free. So when we pump 
too much groundwater, the people that have the deepest wells with the strongest pumps get to continue pumping groundwater. And those with sort of shallower wells with less strong pumps that are less expensive to put in are often left without water afterwards. This means the people that have the most money to build the deepest pumps have the best access to water. And those with less money are more likely to run dry and experience drought. We need to create policy environments that make this not possible. But there's actually technology problems that make it, uh, that would help with implementing a lot of these policies. And so it's this interdisciplinary problem where there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, once again. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Anyone else have a comment on water mining and water use? Okay. Another question from out there somewhere? Simon? Simon. Okay. Um, Michael, you just used the term dramatic action. Um, and so I would simply like to ask all of you to consider what is an example of the kind of dramatic action we need to see? And could we imagine it for the University of Pennsylvania and perhaps for Philadelphia? Let's make it local. I am, I've been super chatty, but I'm gonna say, Penn needs to bring our emissions to zero. And if we can't do it at this very well-resourced campus, then who can? So we need to show leadership and do it here on this campus immediately. I'm happy to add some thoughts here as well. Um, we have a powerful voice here at Penn. Um, this is the institution that was founded by Ben Franklin, who was a scientist he was actually a climate scientist. He studied the Gulf Stream. Um, and he was a, an environmentalist. And he it worked hard to ensure clean water and clean air. And so I think we have a special role um, as an institution that speaks with some authority uh, when it comes to matters of environmental protection and preservation. And so we have to use that voice to influence the entire conversation. Of course, there are things that we can do here at Penn um, to decrease our collective uh, footprint, carbon footprint, and environmental footprint here. But more than that, we have a global footprint uh, with the voice that we have, and we need to use it. And I'll just ask a follow-up, if, uh, if I might, because it's something Mike and I have, have talked about, and I know I've spoken about it with others. We all do what we can as individuals. We ride our bikes, we buy electric cars, and so forth. But is that really the locus of solution for, for the big problem globally? So gratuitous of me to say that that was sort of the subject of my last book, <laughs> The New Climate War. Um, one of the techniques that we see polluters use, because they can't deny climate change is happening anymore, because we can see it's happening. So they've turned to other tactics to try to you know, prevent us from taking the needed actions. And one of those tactics is deflection. Uh, the tobacco industry used it, the beverage industry used it, to convince us that we don't need regulations, we don't need systemic change, we don't need policies that will hurt their profits. What we need to do is just change our individual behavior. It's all up to us. If we just stop eating hamburgers and don't fly to see grandma during the holidays, um, sure, we should do everything that we can to decrease our own individual carbon footprint and our environmental footprint. But we're not going to achieve the massive reductions that are necessary without collective action, systemic change, and policy. And we have a very important election coming up, a presidential election um, in, you know, really just a little more than a, a year? Is it a year? Uh, yep. Where, which will decide the path that we take, whether we continue to lead on the issue of climate and set an example for the rest of the world and bring our global partners together, or whether we shirk our responsibility and provide an excuse to the rest of the world not to act. Thanks, Mike. Yes. Um, not, not to diminish the uh, national scale policy shifts, which are absolutely urgent and vital, but maybe at the scale of the institution, um, there are so many strategies that are well-trod and established paths to eliminating emissions, and emissions is where the focus needs to be. And so pick a sector. Um, if it is corporate travel and uh, 
uh, tracking air miles. We first need to measure to see what needs to be eliminated. If it's energy use and ener electricity production, we first need to see what is the carbon of that electricity. Um, the physical plant, every building material has a supply chain which has carbon emissions embedded throughout. And we need to know in order to choose which materials are lowest carbon, and then we need to choose those. Um, and finally, uh, we need to electrify everything, and that means it's yeah. unconscionable to look at new combustion devices burning fossil energy um, implemented that will have a 30, 40, or longer lifespan in place of procurement rules that can actually change over all of the physical plant that we need to at the most uh, rapid possible clip. Jisung, yeah. Yeah, if I could just double click on something that Michael Mann said. The uh, importance of the upcoming election cannot be understated. Uh, and maybe to say something a little bit controversial, I, I, I would make the case that when it comes to mitigation, systemic policy at the federal level is like a way more important than any individual actions we can we can take. That doesn't obviate the need for being mindful of our choices, but all the evidence that I'm familiar with suggests that without that kind of systemic legislation, mm -hmm. there's no way we can meet the emissions targets that are necessary. But kind of a, on a note of hope, a dramatic action that actually was maybe not as dramatically appreciated happened last year. You know, the yeah. United States passed what was essentially the biggest climate bill in our history, that dramatically, that puts us uh, on a path toward dramatically reducing our emissions. It's certainly not enough. And so maybe the encouragement would be to help us build on that momentum at a policy level so that that kind of emissions reduction systematically can be continued um, in the decades to come. Thanks. All right, one more yeah, example, because Simon asked, right. you know, uh, I was the one who used the term dramatic action, so I feel like I have to defend that choice of language <laughs> here. Um, we saw it just this week with the governor of California uh, suing fossil fuel companies for the damage that they have done, and I think that is another precedent-setting move that really could change the entire political discourse on how we go about acting. I see we have a question. <laughs> Hi, there's also in California, there's legislation that was just passed that is, I think, going to be significant. The governor has said he's going to sign it, and it's about um, carbon disclosure for all corporate, all corporations. And because California is going to adopt it, that means there'll be a California effect that will probably, that will have national effect and will uh, probably connect with the European Union and its similar Green Deal disclosure laws. So that's another Another uh, moment of hope. Hashtag agreed. <laughs> I, I think that uh, from, from my perspective, thinking more about the long term, I'm, I'm doing, we do a lot of adaptation projects and we see all this money coming online through the uh, Infrastructure Act, et cetera, to do adaptation. But if you see the projects that are being done now, they deal with current climate risk and actually to deal with a backlog of, of things that we have been neglecting and communities that we've been neglecting in terms of risk reduction. And what we are not doing, because we're so busy working away that backlog, is starting to understand that we'll be adapting for centuries, essentially, and that if we don't reduce our emissions, the amount of adaptation that needs to be done is significantly more. And the lack of long-term planning about adaptation and with that, the lack of insight in the cost that we're gonna be bearing for our continued emissions is something that really worries me. We really need to start thinking much more about the long term because only if we understand that, we can create action uh, now. Irina. Uh, yes, so uh, very interesting. Yeah, I completely agree, hashtag agree. Uh, <laughs> 
So in terms of simple actions we, we can take, um, there are many lists that have been made uh, in this uh, nonprofit that I'm involved with, uh, Science Moms. We make a list of simple things we can do. For example, you know, go electric, uh, drive less, uh, you know, commute, uh, carpool, commute, use the buses, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're obvious simple things. Um, but I think more than all of these things, uh, vote right and make others vote green. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I was just trying to think in terms of our own university and footprint here, um, as you uh, all, uh, I'm sure, uh, are aware, there's uh, been a, a movement for many years now on campus uh, towards divestment. So what I would see as a dramatic progress uh, would be um, to, for this university to be transparent in the way that they um, uh, invest their money and for us students and faculty and staff to be able to see how our university invests, uh, invests uh, its money. Because if a university one day says, okay, we've divested from fossil fuels, I don't even know what that means unless there is transparency. So I think I think transparency in our uh, in the green uh, nature of our finances would be would be an amazing plus uh, for the future. And and with Irina's words, we're just about out of time, and it it just is left to me to thank our tremendous uh, speakers, uh, and also those of you who asked questions. And I'm also going to sound a note of to my friend Simon Richter in the front row here who has been involved in planning these lectures since 2019. Thank you all.